All right. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about some innovations that have come out in the recent years that allows us to help monitor your pulmonary hypertension while you're at home and also potentially support you with machines that you can walk around with if your medications fail. Uh, so with that, uh, let's, uh, let's proceed. So as many of you know, there are many ways that we try to predict when your disease is getting worse. And essentially, we would love to develop a system that alerts us to when you're getting worse so that we can actually present hospitalization. And as you can see in this slide, these are all, oops, these are all the things that we do when we watch you in clinic. We always watch your weight. We change, we notice changes in your functional capacity, as Dr. Uh, Farber said before, how far you can walk, how short you can walk. We measure your six minute walk test. We do a bunch of laboratory studies to see how your circulation uh, is working. And then we also change and watch your hemodynamics. And as Dr. Farber said, hemodynamics really reflect how your heart circulates blood. Now, if you look at this time frame, you can see very easily that changes in how your heart circulates blood, as measured by the right heart catheterization, is the earliest symptom or sign that something may not be going right. And Changes in these hemodynamics occur before symptoms even start or changes in your weight are reflected. So if there was some way that we can measure these changes in your hemodynamics early, we could prevent hospitalization and you getting worse in the first place. So are there ways that we can do it? Well, obviously, yes. Uh, the way that we check hemodynamics is by using the dreaded right heart catheterization. And I know at this point, everyone who's a patient that's on, uh, on the conference is feeling the right side of their neck, because that's where we do this. But the hemodynamics are still the most important part of our management, because pulmonary hypertension really is a hemodynamic disease. It's a really a disease that affects how your circulation works, particularly how your right heart works. And the right heart cath is still the gold standard to do this. But as many of you know, there are many disadvantages of doing this. Uh, one, it's invasive, and there's some discomfort involved. You have to come to the hospital, you have to go to a sterile environment, you have to be covered in blankets. There is a minimal risk when you do these procedures. It does have a cost associated, it, associated with it. But really, the major, major shortfall is it's only a snapshot in time. And if you think about it, it's really an artificial snapshot. We're doing this test with you lying down, in the resting position, and quite frankly, that's not how many of you operate during your day. You're up and about, and you're feeling shortness of breath when you're doing things. So although this is the current gold standard for measuring hemodynamics, it's probably not the best thing that we have right now. So are there any innovations that allow us to get the same information from the right heart catheterization, but give it to us in a daily level, and without you having to come to the cath lab every month or every three to four months? And the answer is we do now have a way. <clears throat> a new device that's been developed is called the CardiMEMS device. And you can see this in the bottom right portion of your panel. This is a very small device this, uh, that includes a central sensor, which is about the size of a dime that is supported by two uh, wires that we could implant in the pulmonary artery during a right heart catheterization that can measure the pressures in your circulation every day, rest or with ambulation, and transmit this information to your doctor who's at a computer. And this next slide kind of shows how we do this. So we do use a right heart catheterization to place this device. And this is the standard right heart catheterization that you all have had in the past. And you can see this swan Gans catheter going out to your pulmonary artery. We take a picture of the artery that we want to deliver the device in. We leave a little wire in this artery just to guide our path. And then we slip this device up through this wire and we release it into the pulmonary artery. 
the device embeds itself into the pulmonary artery. And then we can activate this device. This is a little x-ray showing where the device is. And then we can activate this device while you're at home by you sleeping on a very special pillow that has an antenna on it. And this antenna transmits radio frequency waves to the device, makes device uh, vibrate, and it sends signals back to the antenna, which is then captured on a little unit that you keep by your bedside. This unit then transmits the pressure in your arteries to us here uh, in the hospital so that we can read it. So virtually you're getting a right heart cath every day at home while you're at the rest of your bed. And this is a picture of the device implanted in your lung. It's usually in the left lung, and as you can see, it's very, very tiny. Well, this is the kind of the information that we can get from this device. And these look like a bunch of squiggly lines to you, but to us physicians, these lines represent the pressures that are in your heart. The red line represents the systolic pulmonary artery pressure, the blue line, the mean, and the red line, uh, excuse me, the green line is the diastolic pulmonary artery pressure. And this little gray zone on the bottom is kind of our map so that we can follow your pressures long term to see how our drug therapies are working. And as you can see in this case, if you follow the gray line on the bottom, you can see that with therapy, this person's pressures gradually come down, moving from left to right on that little screen. So this, drug, this device has been used now uh, very effectively in patients with heart failure, left-sided heart failure. And the use of this device at home to uh, change medications has resulted in a significant reduction in hospitalizations for heart failure. So now we have a device that we know works in heart failure and now also can measure not only pressures, but also the output of your heart. So remember, very carefully, when we do a right heart catheterization, we're looking at your pressures, but we also want to see how much blood your heart is pumping with every minute. And this device can now do that too, with some mathematical derivations uh, uh, to, um, I'm so sorry about that, with, with, some medical, with some mathematical derivations of the pressures that we get from it. So the question is, is it feasible and safe to use this technology in patients like yourselves that have severe pulmonary arterial hypertension? Well, the answer is yes. And this was the result of a very large NIH trial that was completed last year in April. And this is a, this is a slide showing the changes in the hemodynamics of your heart or how well your heart circulates blood. This upper panel to the left shows the pressure in the artery. And you can see that over time, the pressure comes down very, very nicely as we treat this patient and monitor this pressure while you're at home. In this side is the resistance in your arteries, how tight your arteries are in your lungs. And likewise, you can also see with therapy, we can track how the resistance falls in your heart without having to take you back to the cath lab. And most importantly, this measures how much blood your heart is pumping. And as you can see in this patient, as we treated them, the amount of blood increases over time. So all the things that we like to measure in the cath lab, we can now measure with this device in the safety and comfort of your own home. Now I'm gonna show you some examples of how I've used this device in my clinical practice to manage my patients with pulmonary hypertension. This is one of my patients uh, who was uh, very ill with pulmonary hypertension. And this top panel shows the three pressures that we always monitor. Their systolic or top pulmonary pressure, their mean and your diastolic pressure. And as you can see, uh, we've treated the, we, my computer is very sensitive, so I'm very sorry. You can see that we've treated this patient and maintained a very stable pressure at around six, uh, 55 millimeters of mercury. But something weird happened here. This pressure, this patient's pressure uh, jumped uh, very quickly. And we called the patient and asked her what had happened. And what had happened was she had stopped some of her pulmonary hypertension medication because she ran out. And we noted this peak in pressure very easily with the device. And we also noted very carefully, and this measures the output of the heart, that the output also dropped. 
So signals that this patient was not doing very well. We hospitalized her, we put her back on her medications, and we actually added an intravenous uh, prostacycline. And you can see with time that her pressures came down beautifully, almost to normal that we can track at home using the device. And this next uh, patient, this is a patient whom uh, medical therapy did not do well with. And you can see on this bottom, excuse me, on this bottom part of the slide, the gradual increases in this person's pressure that we could monitor with her at home. We can also use this uh, device to help us change therapies uh, to determine the safety of changing therapies to make sure that when we do that, and when we try to simplify uh, therapies, that nothing bad happens while we're doing this. This is an example of a patient whom we weaned from IV therapy to oral therapies. On the bottom part of this slide, you can see uh, the medicines we used. And this patient was on a very high dose of intravenous triprostanol. And you can see during the course of therapy with this patient that we gradually came down on this patient's triprostanol until they were off, while sequentially starting other oral medications, in this case, Riosequat and Selexapeg until the patient was totally on oral therapy. And you can see here during this switch that all her pressures remain exactly stable. So this patient had no problems hemodynamically with making these changes from a very intensive therapy to something that's a little bit more convenient. So these type of changes can now be done safely in the comfort of your home while we monitor your pressures and watch for any pain any changes that may signal that something is not going in the right direction. This is another example of a patient that I treated very successfully with intravenous medications. And this patient was very, very ill with pulmonary hypertension. As you can see here, when we started her pulmonary pressures were in the 80s to 100. This is very, very severe pulmonary hypertension. And each one of these little lines that are coming up and down is me actually titrating her intravenous medication. And you can see I did this in two different ways. I titrated a little more slowly, and when I didn't see the effect I wanted, I start titrating a little bit more rapidly. And you can see as I did that, that her pressures came down very, very nicely, almost to normal. Now a pressure in the 40s, as opposed to a pressure in the hundreds. Again, tracking this all with her at home. And you can see then this very beautiful change in the overall pressure change by this gray curve, how we really, really improved her pressures over time and monitored using this device. We also were able to do uh, monitor the output of your heart. And in this, in this uh, slide, the green and the black are the most important lines to follow because this is actually how much blood the heart is pumping. And as you can see, as we increased her medications, you very nicely note how the output of the heart increased. And most importantly, we know this output was not due to increases in the heart rate. It was all due to the heart contracting better. On this slide, you can see on the black line how the resistance in her artery fell, which was coupled with an increase in the output of her heart that allowed the heart to work a whole lot less to get a bigger bang for the buck. So this device, as you can see, is very, very useful. But the only limitation to this device is that it really takes this large antenna on it in a big pillow for us to really do it. And to actually manipulate this sensor that we can check how your pressures are when you're walking around is a little bit more difficult. But there have been advances in technology, and now there's a newer device that's out which is another pulmonary artery sensor that we place in the right pulmonary artery. And the cool thing about this device is that we can interrogate it using a handheld sensor. So no more pillow that you have to lie on a bed. We can actually have you hold this over your heart during the day and see what your pressures are when you're walking around. And eventually you'll be able to get this information on your iPad or on your iPhone or even your iWatch so you can actually see for yourself how your pressures and the output of your heart is, uh, is improving with the therapy. So really a very, very innovative uh, device and wearables now that we might be able to monitor your heart without having to do the dreaded right heart catheterization. 
Well, I wanted to talk about uh, some new devices now to actually support your heart if it's failing. Now, as you know, when your right heart fails in pulmonary hypertension, that's really when bad stuff starts happening. And we really, up until the last five to six years, have really had no good way to, to effectively treat that type of severe failure, with the exception of doing a lung transplant. However, some very smart people have now developed some very good devices that we can actually implant to take over the work of your heart. And the current approaches uses uh, uh, pumps that we have designed really to treat left heart failure that we're now applying to the right heart. Now this is a very complicated device called ECMO, but essentially what we do with ECMO, if you look at this slide here, is we remove blood from the right side of your circuit, we put it through a pump, we then put it through an oxygenator to put oxygen into the blood, and then we deliver that oxygenated blood to the left side of your heart. Because remember, the left side of your heart is what's delivering all the oxygenated blood to your system. So ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, is one of the techniques that we can now use in the intensive care unit to support the failing heart. Now, there are a lot of problems with those devices, and, and, and most of the time you actually have to lie down and, and stay in bed uh, when these devices are in. Luckily, you don't have to be on a mechanical ventilator most of the time because these devices will also oxygenate your blood. So you can talk and converse with your doctor while your heart's being supported. We can also implant these devices uh, through an operation, but it's a much bigger procedure. And I just wanted to show you this little picture because this is the artificial lung now that we use that can remove blood out of your body, put oxygen in into it, and then deliver it back to the other side, to the left side of your body to keep your left side of your body, your organs, all healthy and oxygenated. Well, this looks like a, a big contraption and it, it is. So we've been working on much tinier contraptions and we now have little impellas or little circulatory devices that we can uh, that we can use in a temporary situation that are inserted just like I showed how you inserted the CardioMEMS device through a right heart cath procedure uh, and, and lay in the pulmonary artery to circulate blood there. So this is an example of a device called an impella. Now what an impella is, is it has a little uh, uh, rotary driven uh, fan-like device that sucks blood out of the right heart and delivers it into the pulmonary artery. So it really takes the job of what the right heart does. Now, unfortunately, all these devices that we have are very temporary. You can't use them for usually more than two or three weeks at a time. Um, so we are trying to make headways now into permanent devices that we can implant to take, this, to take the job of the right heart when it's failing to get people to transplant successfully or eventually to use these as destination therapies. So permanent implantation, kind of like an artificial heart. One of the newer devices that we now have, and this is a very exciting device, is something called a balloon pump. Now balloon pumps are little, are little balloons that uh, inflate and deflate uh, in the arteries uh, of your body. And we've used this technology very, very successfully in the left side of the heart to main people who have congestive heart failure. So again, learning what we learned from the left heart, why can't we apply this to the right heart circulation, which is the problem that's affected in pulmonary hypertension. But we, we can now. And we have a new device called the area device, which is a pump that we can insert in the pulmonary artery. And this shows this little pump working right now. So again, this device, is asserted again through the vein. And I'll try to show you that again. Uh, and it, it goes into the pulmonary artery through the right heart. And you can see the balloon inflating and deflating uh, in this little cartoon. And by inflating and deflating, it actually sucks blood out of the heart and delivers it into the pulmonary system. Now, the cool thing about this device is as the balloon shown here on, on the right-hand side panels, as it deflates, and inflates, that's what allows blood to be drawn out of the heart, almost like a suction, if you can imagine that. And we've now studied this device in the first human studies in 10 patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension in Vienna, Austria. And this device resulted in a significant improvement in the output of the heart, 
on the range of a half a liter to two liters per minute. Now the average human heart will pump five liters of blood per minute. And someone with very, very bad right heart failure, like with pulmonary hypertension, the heart can only pump two liters a minute. So if we can even get the heart to pump one or two extra liters per minute, that results in a significant improvement in symptoms and well-being of the patient. And this device, by supplying up to two liters during exercise, meaning that the patient can walk around with this device, this can be very life-saving for patients who are in very, very severe ill health from pulmonary hypertension, who are waiting for transplant or waiting to get started on therapy, medicines, to try to stabilize their pulmonary hypertension. So I also told you that we are working on devices that we can permanently implant. Now we already have devices that we can do this, but again, they are related and used only for patients who have left-sided heart failure. The right side of the heart continues to be forgotten. However, we are now trying to apply some of this technology to the right heart and pulmonary hypertension. Now the problem with our current devices is they're very big. So some smart technician has now developed this very small pump which you can see fits in the palm of the hand and is no bigger than a double A battery that we can insert between the right heart and the pulmonary artery and serve as a pump. Now these pumps can also be hooked up to an oxygenator to totally, totally bypass the pulmonary arteries and selectively deliver oxygenated blood to the left side of your heart as I showed you with the temporary devices in ECMO. So these are big devices on the current development and I'm really looking forward to these because I really think this is going to be a novel way to treat patients with severe pulmonary hypertension in the throes of very severe right heart failure. So uh, at this point, these are all experimental devices. These are all going to be coming out in clinical trials uh, shortly. And these are all things I want you to all to look out for and to maintain a high level of hope that we will have these devices to treat patients in the near future. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and, uh, and answer any questions. Wow, you know, everybody has um, their computers muted, including myself, so you didn't hear me saying, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's excellent, thank you both, and thank you, Ray, for showing us those devices. Those are amazing. So, um, one question is, can these devices be used in children? Do you have any data on that? You know, these devices have not yet been used in children. Um, the, uh, the, the indications for these devices currently are in adults. However, this is merely a sizing problem. So for the balloon pump, we do have pediatric balloon pumps that already exist for the left side of the heart. Mm -hmm. So eventually this pump, this balloon pump will be downsized to fit children. In addition, that little itty bitty pump I showed you there that you can use in the palm of your hand, that's pretty well suited for children right now. And we can use that. And that's actually called a, uh, that is actually a, uh, a pediatric pump that was initially designed for children for left side of support that we now thought can be utilized in right side of support. So yes, uh, children, we can definitely push this to, to children, I think in the next five to six years. Fantastic. One question for you and for Hap and, um, and any other panelists on the, on who are gonna speak, um, but came up, how has or, or has our research, clinical research, et cetera, been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic? How has that impacted clinical trials and, and research? Well, well, it has had a pretty significant impact, yeah. but, but luckily only a temporary one. So during the COVID pandemic, you know, to, to make sure that we were all taking care of each other and maintaining social distances, uh, very important for the patients, but also for the healthcare providers. Most clinical trials were put on hold uh, for, the, for the period of time. Uh, at our institution at Ohio State, we have now reopened our clinical trials and we're back in business. But we did have about a four month lapse in clinical trial enrollment, which has really slowed down uh, a lot of the clinical trials and enrollment. Well, I think it's, um, it's two headed. I mean, part of it is um, patients, Part of it is rightfully so because they're worried patients didn't want to come out of the house into the hospital for a clinical trial because they were worried about getting infected while they were in the hospital for their visits. And two, the hospitals 
didn't really have the resources at that point in time to deal with clinical trials because everything was directed towards taking care of patients who, who, ha who had COVID. I think at least in Boston or in Massachusetts now where the curve is really flat, um, we have started or we will start opening up again. So I think it's, it's, been, uh, it's been hard, but you know, that's the way, that's the world. So, you know, the one silver lining that you could think about for the patients who are listening in is that the, the COVID pandemic has made us a lot smarter as clinical researchers. So we've really been trying to design ways now to do clinical trials in the safety of a patient's home. Uh, so many of the techniques that we have now used to, uh, and <clears throat> use in patients when they come to clinic we're developing apps for, for you to do at home. For example, the six minute walk test, there's an app now that you can do at home. The CardioMEMS device that I just showed you can take the place of a right heart catheterization that we do for clinical trials. So I think it's made us very adaptive and I think that's gonna be beneficial for future clinical trial development because I think it's gonna take some of the burden off the patients having to come into clinic all the time uh, to participate in these life-saving clinical trials. Right, it's also made, um to just extend what Ray said, it also makes the companies that are conducting the uh, clinical trials a little more thoughtful in how they actually want to do their clinical trials and how many exactly. studies a patient really actually needs. Mm -hmm. Fantastic.